17 years old. Amen. Man, Thank the Lord. And that's been 20 years ago. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated this evening. Sure is good to see everybody out this evening. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of folks that uh, need prayer tonight. And uh, we're going to pray and have a little fellowship and get right in the Word of God tonight really quick. Uh, we've got a lot to do uh, this evening, a lot to talk about. Uh, let's pray for those that are, are that are gone traveling and gone on uh, off on vacation and stuff. I got texts from some people that's on their way. Going to be a little bit late tonight, but uh, we're really glad that you're here. A um, couple things, right quick. Don't forget to pray for us uh, down at this youth camp down in Georgia. They're leaving in the morning and uh, preaching a lot. So pray, pray the Lord just blessed. His will will be done. Let's don't forget. Uh, Wednesday night, be here, bring somebody with you. Kids' class will be going on. Uh, some of y'all have missed Wednesday night lately. Be sure and be here Wednesday night. Then don't forget Saturday morning, we're going to visit at 9.30. Our big day coming up, July the 8th. July the 8th is our, our uh, most churches call it homecoming. We usually call it anniversary. But uh, anyway, that big day's coming up on the 8th, and then we're leaving to go to youth camp on the 9th. So it's summer right on, buddy. Once, once it gets past youth rally, it's just like, shoom, gone. And it'll be fall before we know it. What a blessing. Miss Dot is back with us tonight, feeling better. Amen. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm glad she's here because our offering's low when she's not here. No. Uh, I thank the Lord for Miss Dot. Appreciate her being here tonight. And don't forget to pray for Miss Miss Manis, Miss Mary. She's still in pretty rough shape, y'all. Uh, I don't I don't know if she got out of ICU or not, but I got over there the other day, not long after she had had her surgery, and she was talking. But uh, you know, it's pretty serious. So remember to remember to pray for her tonight. Okay, all right. Um, we're just gonna go to the Lord in prayer. We've got a lot to pray about, a lot to be praying for, and let's ask God to do something real and special here this evening. If you've got somebody, something, I, sh I got a lot of special requests, real special one tonight. Uh, if you uh, got somebody, let me know I'm an uplifted hand. All right, let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for our health. Thank you for our strength. Thank you for all the many blessings of life that you've given us. We come before you this evening asking forgiveness of all of our sins. Everything we've done, everything we've said, everything we hadn't done that we should have done or hadn't said we should have said, we ask forgiveness. Wash us in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm so thankful for our hope in him. I pray now tonight that you look down from heaven. Bless this service. God, run the devil away from here. I plead the blood of Jesus over every single person here tonight, every need, every heart, every life. God, do what ought to be done here tonight. Touch every life. Save that one which is lost. Bless everyone that's here this evening. Bless those that are sick, not able to get out. And I pray the Holy Spirit would do a great and mighty work. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. All right, let's stand, turn around and be friendly. Everybody, well, turn around there and be friendly to somebody tonight.
just remain standing, please. Everybody just remain standing. Had a little extra time of fellowship there, trying to get caught up on everything. Let's remember Brother Randy's mother. She is in the hospital over here in Grace Hospital uh, in Morganton, having some uh, problems. So don't forget to pray for Mrs. Dale uh, over there in the hospital tonight and, uh, and others that need our prayers really bad too also. Okay? All right. I um, hope that you'll give tonight, honor the Lord, do right. He'll bless you for it, okay? Amen. Everybody, honor God, do right, and uh, let's pray the Lord just bless this offering tonight, okay? Amen. 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 Big T, you lead us in prayer. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Pray now that you bless this offering tonight. Let it be what you want it to be for the glory of God. Lord, I pray for all the people out there that's, that's in such bad shape. May your will be done, dear Lord. Please, God, send revival in these last days. God, do a miracle here tonight. Speak to our hearts through your word, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, somebody send my mic up here for me right quick. We're going to get right into the scripture tonight because we've got some stuff to get to. So let's get our Bibles this evening. Amen. Everybody get your Bibles open this evening. And uh, we're, we're going to look at several scriptures. So we won't, won't turn to um, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 to start with. Now I'm on here. Right? Hello? Um, I had uh, most y'all. Some most y'all seen that picture. I guess somebody put it put it out everywhere. But yeah, we had a bear in our yard the other day, y'all. Uh, Kelly looked out the kitchen window, and it just come right out of the woods, right down, right down, right and behind my house. I mean, I got we got pictures. I've got a video of it, and it just come out about that tall, and uh, that thing come out like that, and went right in front around the carport, and right on down. And uh, I thought, oh, Lord, what in the world is that supposed to mean? And uh, I got a video of it on my phone. And it's uh, uh, one of my friends in Tennessee sent me. He'll hear this. He said, uh, he said, you're like Elisha, and somebody's talking about you, and a she-bear come out of the wood and going to eat them. I said, that sounds good to me. So if anybody been saying anything bad, you better look out because the bear is coming out of the woods after you. And I'll tell him where you live. Her, it's she bear. That's what it was in the Bible. Uh, uh, I, when they're that big and their arms that big, I don't guess it matters if it's a he or a she. All right, in Ephesians chapter four, we're going to start there tonight and um, um, look here in the Word of God here this evening at a verse here tonight and um, look at verse number uh, I don't know thirty long in there, Ephesians chapter three. Uh, and I'm sorry, there ain't no Ephesians 3.30. 20, sorry about that. Um, what did I say? What did you say? 4.30. 4.30, you're right. And grieve not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, capital S. That's the Holy Spirit that's inside you. Of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. I want to preach tonight on the subject, how do you treat the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God is inside you if you're saved. Think about that. Inside you, literally. Everywhere you go, you take him. Everything you do, 
you drag him into it. The Holy Spirit of God is inside of a Christian. You understand the Bible, the doctrine of the Trinity. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. One God eternally manifest in three distinct personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been called the executive of the Trinity, or the executive of the business or the work of God in this world. Jesus talked about it in John 14, 16, when he said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Once in a while, somebody gets uh, uh, aggravated when I say something about the Holy Spirit being gone at the rapture, and they always come back with that thing of, well, the Holy Spirit can't be gone because people get saved during the tribulation, and if the Holy Spirit's gone, how can they get saved? It's not what I'm preaching on, but you got to understand, when he's gone, he's still here. He was here before he got here, right? He was here all the way through the Old Testament. He'd come on and go, come and go. But in the age of grace in the New Testament church, he's literally in the believer and never leaves. Now when the rapture comes, he's taken out of the way. He's the only one that could possibly hinder the Antichrist from being revealed. Some nut came out the other day and is now teaching that he that hinders the Antichrist is the body of the Antichrist. That's getting far out there in private interpretation. But anyway, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, uh, when he is come, he shall come, he shall come. What do you mean he shall come? He, was he already here? Yes. Well, when he was come on the day of Pentecost and it indwelt them and circumcised them spiritually and made them into his body. That's what he was referring to when he has come. And so he was here before he come. He'll be here after he's gone. So we'll get into that some other time. But he is pictured as a dove, and he lives inside of you. Never forget this. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just a force like electricity or some kind of power. He is a person, a living person. He's God. When you deal with the, with the Holy Spirit, you are dealing with God. I prove that in the Bible. He, he, he is not God the Father called, but he's God, the third person of the Godhead. Now, I want to ask you tonight how you treat him. He's a permanent resident in your life, and, uh, and he said, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the resident the president? That's what this message is about. Is the resident the president? Is he that lives inside you tonight ruling in your life? Let's say this. Number one. Number one tonight, he can be grieved. He can be grieved. In this verse here that I read to you tonight, it said, and grieve not, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You can grieve him. Now think about that tonight. Have you ever been grieved? Uh, how, what would be a good example of grief? I'll tell you, tell you what a good example of grief would be. Being took, being took somewhere you don't wanna be and having to sit and listen to something you don't wanna listen to or be around something you don't like being around. Has that ever happened to y'all? Have you ever been out with a bunch of people and you wound up in a place where you just felt completely out of place? You felt like, I have no business being here. This ain't where I need to be. I don't fit in here. I'm, I'm telling you, you uh, some of these, uh, uh, I'm not talking about just a beer joint or some hell hole out there in the world. There's a lot of places. Listen, there's stores in the mall nowadays that honestly, I, you grieve the Holy Spirit of God uh, when you got it. There's, there's restaurants you go into. These restaurants where they try to make them all wicked and they ain't nothing but just nasty, low-talking, trashy stuff and, they, and all the kids like them, these beach restaurants and these places, come on in, you know, and we're gonna have a good time and, and you order chicken, but it's a bunch of filth, you know, or some kind of crab shack or some kind of uh, like that. Places like that grieve the Spirit of God. Now, I believe you can sit in a place like that and be right or eat whatever, but uh, you know the Spirit of God can be grieved really easy. That would grieve me. If it grieved me as wicked as I am, I can't imagine how the Spirit of God must feel uh, when you drag him into a place like that. He can be grieved. 
by our attitudes, unspiritual attitudes, being hateful, smart mouth, losing your temper, like I preached about this morning, lifestyles, deliberately living opposite from what he wants you. I, I know this for a fact. You can put a, a song on the radio that will grieve the spirit of God on you. You can do it. I've done it before. When I first got saved, I still listened to bad music for a long time, and I'd put stick one of them tapes in my stereo, and it just felt like I went, Psh. something just popped the balloon. You can sit there all you want to. You can say, Brother Danny's got his opinion, I got mine. You can say, well, I don't see nothing wrong. Till you're blue in the face, and you know good and well that kind of music that some of y'all listen to grieves the Spirit of God. Amen. And Lord, they got it in churches nowadays. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know how the Spirit, I've, I've been preaching a few places where I felt like I had to pray the Lord left while I, before I could get up there. That's the way it felt. And so you can grieve the Spirit of God. We ought to be careful tonight not to grieve the Spirit of God by our words, by our action, by our attitude, by our habit, and anything about that. Number two, the Holy Spirit can be quenched. He can be quenched. What does that mean? In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, it said, quench not the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, uh, immediately would come to mind, uh, you pour water on the fire and quench that fire. Pouring water on, pouring cold water on the, something the Lord is doing. A failure to pray, failure to work, failure to witness, laying out a church, not giving, not praying. You can quench the Spirit of God. I believe a lot of people quench the Spirit of God sitting right here on Sunday morning. They stay on their cell phone the entire time. You are quenching the Spirit of God, running in and out. So that crowd that sits right back there they talk the entire service. And don't be too judgmental. Some of you adults sit there and do the very same thing. Uh, you can quench the Spirit of God. Amen? That's right, brother. Uh, running in and out two or three times a service. It seems like the same people have to get up and go out every single time we have church. i tell you what you do. You tell them kids go to the bathroom before you start. You tell them to put everything up. And when preaching starts, uh, we look ahead. We pay attention. We honor God. We honor the singing. You can quench the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, sir. I guarantee you, I, I was preaching a revival one time. And uh, it, the Lord was blessing I'm telling this, the Lord was blessing this church. It was, you could feel it. You know, you've been there. You've been in a service where it got good and, and uh, people were shouting, people going to the altar and getting right with God. You could just tell. And if you've been doing this a long time, you can tell when people's ready for the preaching. And the preacher got up and he said, well, we're ready for the preacher. And I was sitting over here just chomping at the bed. It's just like the salad had been served. The atmosphere was right. And I was ready to get up and deliver the mail. And about that time, this old boy come walking down the aisle over here like that. He said, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute. God's put something on my heart. And, uh, and, and the preacher, you know, you could just tell. Now, come on, brother. We done had testimonies and everything. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He said, I just want to get up here. And I mean, the Lord told me to get up here and sing a song by Nickelback. And he said, I, I just want to get that. And I thought, what, are you nut? Are you drunk? I, what in the world? You crazy, crazy nut. Get down. And uh, I mean, it's just like the Spirit of God went psh, right out of that place. Amen. Nickelback, man, I'm, I'm in the testimony. And then he said something else crazy, and it, it just killed it better than 4 o'clock. How many of you have ever been in church when somebody gave a testimony that was completely it, it was set, their testimony sounded like this. All right, Miss Desi's going to come up here and play some great song. Here's their testimony. That's what it sounded like. That's what it sounded like spiritually. Amen. I mean, it's just like, oh, Lord. How many have ever heard that done in church? I mean, just completely off. I, I wish I could think of a few I've heard. Lord have mercy. Uh, it, it was awful. But you can greet, quench the Holy Spirit. Number three. Let's go through these right quickly tonight. You know, he can be lied to. He can be lied to. Hey, if that wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't think it could happen. How can you lie to the Holy Spirit? Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. You know the story. I preached on it not long ago, so I ain't going to tell you the whole story. They sold their land. Everybody was selling their land, giving all the money to the church. They sold some land. 
and lied about it and claimed they give all the money to the church. Now, it's their land. They keep it if they want to. Nobody made them do it. But their sin was they tried to make everybody think they gave it all when they really didn't give it all. And Ananias come in, he said, hallelujah, Peter, hallelujah. God bless you, brother. Oh, God's been good. The Lord told me in Sapphira, you know that word uh, uh, Ananias, I think it means uh, something like rendering, like uh, Sapphira means pretty. She must have been a pretty woman. I don't know. Uh, Ananias, Ananias means Jehovah is gracious. And Ananias come in and he, said, he laid that down. He said, uh, Peter, uh, we sold the land for $100,000 and they really sold it for 150000 We sold it for $100,000 and there's all the money and we're gonna give it to the church. Oh, hallelujah. I like that man on a big scene and about that time Peter jumped up. He said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He lied to the Holy Ghost. That's a pretty serious charge, people. So evidently, when you come in and you make ever make the preacher and everybody else think that you're giving it all and you're really not, you are in some form lying to the Holy Ghost. That's a dangerous sin. You'd be better off to say, preacher, pray for me. I ain't giving like I'm supposed to. Don't act like one man, you know, he put he put a, a $20 bill around a whole bunch of ones, you know, and put that 20 out there so everybody can see it. And make Make, it, make everybody try to make everybody think he's given more. He lied to the Holy Ghost. Save people can be uh, influenced by the devil. And uh, you know what he told him? You you can't show me anywhere in the Bible where Ananias and Sapphira wasn't saved. There's no indication that they were unbelieving Jews, giving all their money, or at least part of it, selling their pot money and giving it to a church. They were included in the saved people. And the Bible said, Satan filled thine heart. Can Satan fill the heart of a believer? What said? You said, that Jesus, oh, just, just hush a minute. We believe the Bible. Just because you can't understand something don't mean it ain't true and it ain't right. Help me now, say amen. Hey, he said, Satan filled your heart, boy. I'm telling you tonight, listen, hey, I guess you lie to the preacher in the church about your dedication, you're lying to God. I don't know, but there's no indication that these two people were lost. They are the group who want the spiritual people to think they're spiritual. You listen? These are the people who want the spiritual people to think they are spiritual. There is no chance that unsaved Jews in that in that. New Testament put their money into a local church or heathen. Didn't happen. Uh, the Romans chapter 8 and verse 13 talks about sinning will kill you and Ananias drop dead in the floor. Now, the question comes up, why don't that happen now? And the answer to that is when God's working and it's hot, I know about the working of God is hot in a church like it was in that early church. Jesus had just went back to heaven. The Holy Spirit was in the, the apostles. They had the signs of an apostle and they were doing this work and they had all this work going on and they were working miracles. There were thousands being saved. So it was, it was hot, brother. It was hot. When the Spirit of God's moving like that, the judgment of God's also moving like that, and miracles. I have an idea. We've grieved the Spirit of God off from America for so long. He don't, he's not even welcome in a lot of places. And he's not, well, we grieve him so much, he can't kill nobody or save nobody. I mean, all that stuff happens when God's working in a church. I'm telling you tonight, he can be lied to. Are you listening? When God's working, there's still some miracles happen every now and then. When God's working, they still some people die every now and then. Ladies and gentlemen, he can be lied to. Number four, he can be tempted. He can be tempted. Acts chapter five, verse nine, Sapphira came in three hours later. That's proof that it takes a woman three hours longer to get ready to go to church than it does a man. I didn't write the Bible, I'm just preaching to you. If you got a problem with that, tell it with the Lord. Here she comes in three hours later. She had to drive her own car. They didn't want to ride together because she wasn't ready. Didn't have her makeup on. And Lord, she come in there painted up like Tammy Faye. Lord, they, they, said, they said, poor Tammy, you know, she passed away the other day, a couple years ago, and, 
and Mary Kay went out of business. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, here comes Sapphire in there, and she, I, no, no, I ain't got nothing against that poor lady. So I, I met her actually and talked to her one time. But uh, uh, they, they come in there, and she come in there, hallelujah, hallelujah, woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they said, uh, what you shouting about, sister? She said, me and my husband sold our land for $100,000, and I'm sure he's done gave it all. She probably come in late because she wanted everybody to see how she was dressed. Uh, you know, uh, I come walking in and she just thought, they're looking at me, they're looking at me, they're looking at me. I've known people like that. I've literally known people that thought when they walk into church, everybody's looking at me, everybody looking at me. And really, the Lord's going, oh, uh, uh, when he looks down at you. And uh, you know what? She come in there and Ann and I said, uh, uh, how much did y'all sell that land for? She said, $100,000. And we gave it all to the Lord. And he said, uh, you, tem- you, you tempting the Holy Spirit, girl. And the feet of them that buried your husband's right there. Uh, you, you know what? Your husband's laying out there in the grave. They say some people don't get straightened out till they die. And that's when they lay them in that casket. And butted down she fell, and they took her out and buried her. You can tempt the spirit of the Lord. You better be careful about that. You come in collaborating some false story, and brother, they, they, and listen, you, you hear me tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, some, some people never do get straightened out until they're dead and in the grave. I, I can tell you story after story after story after story of churches and preachers that have done business deals that are wrong, that are crooked, that won't pay their bills, that won't give money to a contractor. And I'm telling you, that ain't right. That's tempting the Spirit of God. If anybody in town ought to have a good testimony about paying their bills, ought to be the church and the church people. You owe somebody some money, pay them. And if you can't pay them, go to them and say, look, I know I owe you this, and I'll get it to you just as quick as I can. Man up! Man up! I had a preacher tell me one time, he's talking to me about another preacher, and I said, oh, is that guy preaching? He said, yeah. He said, ain't nobody got no confidence in him. He said, he owes everybody in this town and won't say he pays bills, as in Marion. And uh, I thought, man, that's a bad testimony to have. Somehow, sometimes preachers think because they're a man of God, people ought to just cut them slack on everything and let them away with it. No, sir, no, sir. We ought to pay our bills just like everybody else. If people cut you some slack, thank God for it. But if they don't, pay man up, pay up, and do people right just like you're supposed to. There's one thing, none of our phone company, Duke Power, Duke Energy, our, our mortgage at the bank up yonder, nobody can say this church don't pay their bills. That's tempting the Spirit of God. Number five, he can be resisted. He can be resisted. He sure can. Acts chapter seven, verse 51. You know what he told them people? Let's flip over there and look at that verse tonight. It's a very important verse of scripture. Acts chapter number uh, seven and verse 51. Here in the word of God, uh, the Lord, uh, the apostle was preaching and he said this, Acts chapter seven and verse number 51. He said this, he said, you stiff necked and uncircumcised, that's what I was talking about a while ago, uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Now you listen to me this evening. He can be resisted. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He never forces you to do anything. He lives inside you. If you start to go in somewhere where you're not supposed to go, a little voice will say, you shouldn't be going in here, but he ain't gonna grab you and throw you out. He'll just sit right there and let you go on in with it. If you start to say something you shouldn't say, a little voice will say, you shouldn't be saying that. If you turn something on the TV and all of a sudden something pops up there you shouldn't be looking at, he'll say, you shouldn't be looking at that. You shouldn't be watching that. This is not right. You know what I'm talking about? He'll talk to you. But you know what you can do? You can resist him. You can resist him for salvation. One of the points of Calvinism is irresistible grace. And a five-point Calvinist, and if you believe any two of them, you are a five-point. If you believe any two points of Calvinism, you believe all five. It's impossible not to believe the other one. The only one you can get by with is the last one, perseverance of the saint, and it depends on how you believe that. But there is no such thing in the Bible or out of the Bible as irresistible 
grace and resisting the Holy Spirit of God is not possible. Calvinist teaches that you're dead in trespasses and sin and since you are, you can't come to Christ until the Holy Spirit touches you and quickens you. Then you can come. That means he quickens you and makes you alive before you can come to him and get saved? No, that ain't right. That ain't right. You come to him and then he quickens you and you're made alive in Christ. The Holy Spirit does not. I heard a guy preach it all the other day on the radio. Good man. I believe he loves God, but he's so confused. I'm telling you, he thought this stuff uh, before the world ever was. God picked me out to do this and that. And I'm telling you what you could have done. You could have rejected him and went to hell if you'd have chose to. I know I'll get it for saying that. You say, but God don't. God knows, don't he? Yeah, sure he does. That's foreknowledge. But God does not make the choice for anybody. Say amen, people. That's sound doctrine. That's Bible preaching. God, your choice is up to you. You can go to hell if you resist the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, no. One man told me one time, one, he was a deacon, not one of our deacons. He's a deacon. I preach somewhere. And he said, uh, uh, he said, you ain't got no business preaching. And I said, well, I bet them 11 people got saved down there this week don't think that. And he said, oh, they'd have got saved anyway. I said, you trying to tell me if none of us do anything, they're gonna get, he said, that's right. That's a dangerous, that's, fatalist, that's a fatalistic doctrine. If you believe everybody in the world could quit and they're all gonna get saved anyway, what? listen, if I believe that, if I really believe that, the first thing I do tomorrow morning is sell every one of them buses, if I believe that. If I believe that everybody's gonna be saved, it's gonna be, and ain't nothing we can do about it one way or the other, I'd drop every missionary, and to tell you the truth, I don't even know if I'd come to church regular. It'd feel weird. What are we doing? Just keep patting each other on the back? I love the Lord and I love church, but people, we are on a mission. Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature and they that hear and believe will be saved. And if a man don't, he'll be damned. There are people go to hell if we don't do what we're supposed to. The blood will be on our hands. He can be resisted. That's con you think that's controversial? Listen to the next one. He can be blasphemed. He can be blasphemed. In Mark chapter three and verse 20, 28, 29, 30, along in there, uh, the Lord said, uh, if, if a man, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you have never forgiveness in this world, neither in the world to come. Ever since I've been saved, I've had bukus. That's a Greek word, means a lot. Uh, uh, people come up to me and said, said, what is blaspheming the Holy Ghost? I've had plenty of people come up to me and say, Brother Danny, I don't believe there's no hope for me. I said, why? I think I've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I'm doomed. There is no hope for me. And I said, why do you think that? And they said, well, one time there was this woman up shouting and we laughed at her when I was little and mama told me I blasphemed the Holy Ghost and I'm just doomed for hell. And I said, that is so dumb and far off base. I didn't even know. That's not what it said. That's not what it is. And I ain't got a time to tell you. It could be a whole sermon, whole series of sermon, but let me, let me just say briefly this. People uh, I live everywhere who live in fear, and I know a lot of preachers that feel like it's their, their calling to say who's cut off and who can't get saved, and they're reprobates, and they can't run. Listen, it ain't my job or your job to say who's crossed any of God's deadlines. The truth is, the Lord can save anybody and would save anybody. The problem ain't with him, it's them. If they can believe, he'll save them. If they can ask him, he can forgive it. But when you do give me a reprobate like that, the problem is your mind. It ain't with God. Don't you ever get a mind and say, I believe old so-and-so's crossed the deadline and he can't get saved. You better be careful talking about somebody like that. What if they ain't? And you're just talking them into it. I know people that say everybody who commits a certain sin or whatever automatically reprobate. That ain't the Bible. That ain't what it says. Hey, hey, let me tell you something tonight. So let's talk about what the Holy Spirit, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not. First of all, blaspheming the Holy Spirit 
is not saying no to Jesus. How many preachers you ever got up saying, now we know there's only one sin you can't be forgiven for, and that's just saying no to Jesus all your life. He didn't say that. The Lord didn't say, if you say no to me, you have never forgiven me. Well, of course, uh, you ain't going to heaven if you say no to him your whole life. He didn't say that. I heard somebody get up one time and they said, well, there's only one sin you can't be forgiven for and that's, and that's uh, not getting saved. There's only one sin you can't be forgiven for and that's killing yourself. I said, I mean, so you can't get saved to kill yourself. I said, why? He said, because who, you wouldn't have that sin forgiven. I said, well, what if you lust after somebody and they die? You going to hell? What if you think a bad thought or tell something ain't right and you die? You going to hell then? Did you know? <laughs> did you know? I like the way them kids are listening. That shows they're listening. Listen, did you know that the, the chances of you dying with no sin in you, on you at all, is slim to none? The chances of you dying in a perfect state of mind is slim, people. Have you done everything you should do today? No, you ain't. I ain't neither. You say, well, if you... Oh, somebody said, can a suicide go to heaven? Samson did. He's listed in the hall of fame, a faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, I ain't got time to get into all of that. That is not the Holy Spirit. You know what it is? It's looking in the Bible. I challenge anybody, show me where this is wrong. In the Bible, the only time anybody blasphemed the Holy Spirit was when the Pharisees stood looking at Jesus Christ in the flesh and said, you're working miracles by the power of Satan. Am I right or am I wrong? I'm right. That's the only time. It never happened in the Old Testament. It never happened in the book of Acts. Paul never mentions it in his epistles. It's never mentioned before or after scripturally. You want scripture? You want Bible preaching? Here it is. The only time anybody ever blasphemed the Holy Ghost was when Jesus Christ was here in the flesh and they looked at him and said, you're doing that by the power of Satan. And he looked and said, you'll never be forgiven for that. It's never happened before or since. You say, but I know a woman at work, now, but I know the Bible. That's different from me and you. You know an uncle that thought something, and I'm telling the Bible. Your problem is you heard so you heard Benny Hinn, or you heard somebody on the right, on the right, and he told about some man that cussed the preacher and, and died the next day, and, and you said, oh, I heard that story. Yeah, okay, I believe in all them stories, but I'm giving you the Bible. Amen. Somebody said, well, the only sin you can be forgiven for is denying the Lord. That ain't what he said. The only sin you can be forgiven for is rejecting the Lord. That ain't what it said. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit ain't something you do. It's something you say. That's what the word blaspheme means, to speak against. It's sin committed with the tongue. Isn't that funny that the only sin a person can't be forgiven for is committed with the tongue? By thy words thou shalt be justified. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, say you. That tongue can damn you or it can get you saved buddy if it'll say the right words it's a fire no man can tell right there boy it'll get you in more trouble than you'll ever get out of he can be blasphemed amen now one more thing and I'm through we'll, we'll, not, we'll get into a doctrine we'll study that blasphemy again finally he can be obeyed he can be obeyed that, thank God he'll bless you He'll lead you. I don't believe the Lord's playing hide and go seek with us. I don't believe he's saying, all right, if you do my will, I'll bless you, and you have to figure out what it is, have fun. I think he wants to lead us. You know, one of the greatest blessings I've ever had in my life when it felt like a few times the Lord was leading me. He'll, I mean, I'm telling you, it don't happen all the time. But there's those few times once in a while, hallelujah, when he'll put something on my heart to do or say, and I'm telling you, it's just right on target. Like I told you about that thing up there in West Virginia that time. I was preaching year before last. Little bitty church, the whole, the whole church ain't as big as this little one section of seats right here. And I was up there always preaching that night. I didn't know these people. 
And I was up there screaming and hollering and preaching. And they got these big old mountain boys in there, old redneck coal miners. And they brought them in there that night. And I got up and I was a preaching. And I was preaching my head off. And I said, you better get saved, big boy. You better get saved, big boy. I'm telling you, you better get right with God. Well, about two hours after service, the preacher had a knock on his door. Them guys come to his house. They said, man, we're tore up, preacher. He said, you guys, let's get down here and get saved. They said, let's do it. They got down there and got saved. He said, who was that guy? He said, that's Brother, Brother Danny. He's a friend of mine from North Carolina. Somebody's talking about me. I feel sorry for you. Uh, he said, he's a friend of mine from North Carolina. And he said, how do you know my name? He said, what are you talking about? How do he know who I was? I've been up there screaming and hollering, you better get saved, big boy. And his name was Big Boy, nickname. Everybody in, everybody in West Virginia got a nickname. It was Big Boy. They called him that his whole life. And he thought I was talking to him. I said, you're going to hell, big boy. And I didn't say that no other night. That's the truth, people. Oh, that's just luck. It happens over and over and over, stuff like that. The Holy Spirit can be obeyed. That's what the difference in Bible preaching and teaching you can teach without preaching, but you can't preach without teaching. And real Bible preaching has a, has a supernatural element in it that we can't figure out. Listen, people, I don't know what it is, but there's something about a man getting hooked up just right preaching. Something happens in the crowd that don't happen no other time. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. And I, there's nothing like it. If you've ever been in church where a man had it right, Bam, and he was plugged. There's something about that. You say, you know what? That wasn't just him up there. There's somebody else working. I told you about that story in Marion. Uh, my son-in-law, uh, Wesley, told me about it. He said, he said you, you remember a guy named something? I said, no, sure don't. This is about two, a year ago. He said this guy, he said this guy was one of these boys that was super duper particular over his hair. You ever, you ever met a boy? And I don't know a girl's like that, but this is a boy. And he couldn't stand, he couldn't stand some, just touch your hair. He'd be ready to fight you if you touched his hair like that right there. Don't make fun of mine. A weed eater hit me back there the other day. Everybody's been laughing at me all day. But he, he, he couldn't stand his hair messed up. He said, don't touch it. Don't touch your hair. Now, there are a lot of girls like that. I know there's some in here tonight. I won't call no names. Uh, <laughs> when the wind's blowing, they come walking in like this because they don't want their hair messed up. I ain't calling no names. Uh, but, you know, that's all right for a woman, but for a man, that's a little weird. He said, that guy, he said he couldn't stand somebody to touch his hair. And I was preaching up, he said, he was preaching, he said, you don't know this. It was, it, was, it was 25 years ago. He said, I was up running around screaming, hollering. There's 500 people sitting in there. I was running, he, that boy come to church one time on Sunday night. And he said, I was running around preaching and I run back there like that and just put my hand on his head. That's the truth. He liked to die. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, I said, I never knew that. And you know what? For somehow or another, the Lord got a hold of that boy and he is a preacher right now to this day. As far as I know, I think he might be pastoring a church somewhere. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? There's something about real preaching. You don't get that teaching. It comes out during preaching. How many times has a preacher, I got up and you, and you want to preach something and you just feel the Lord just pushing you another direction, another direction. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit can be obeyed. Now, he'll, he'll lead you if you'll quit grieving him. If you're forcing him to go places he don't want to go, and forcing him to listen to music he don't like. It's like somebody said about smoking. You're blowing smoke in the Holy Ghost's face. I don't know about all that. But he said, if you're forcing him into going places he don't need to be going. Or taking him places he's not happy with. He, he ain't going to lead you. You're grieving him. How do you treat the Holy Spirit? Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Ever head bowed? Every eye's closed tonight. Miss Desi's coming to the piano. While she's coming, let's all just bow our head and close our eyes. Maybe, maybe we need to say, you know what, Lord? 
I'm bought with a price. I'm sealed to the day of...